It is midday on January the 27th, 1999, a dark day for the city of Hamburg. Ten-year-old Hilal Erchan arrives home from school. She is happy, her face beaming with joy, as she excitedly shows her family her half-year report card. Her grades are excellent. Her hard work has paid off. To reward her for being such a diligent student, her parents give their daughter money to treat herself to some sweets at a nearby mall. Hilal then takes off with a spring in her step, but what was to be a rewarding day after months worth of studying would sadly end in heartbreak. Around 35,000 children and young people are reported missing in Germany every year. However, most of those cases are harmless. Oftentimes, children have stayed at a friend's house or hung out outside and reappeared the next day. At least 900 minors under the age of 14 are currently considered to be permanently missing in Germany. This includes children who are believed to have been abducted abroad by a parent or who have fled from home. Only two dozen, like Hilal Erchan, are likely to have fallen victim to a crime. Hi Gators, my name is Saki and welcome to The Investigator. Today, we are looking at the case of Hilal Erchan, who disappeared in Germany in 1999. Since World War II, this has been the longest-running child case in Hamburg that went unsolved, despite all the work that went into solving it. Without giving too much away, let's dive right in. According to the Deutsche Post 2020, the people of Hamburg, alongside the people of Schleswig-Holstein, are the happiest people in Germany. And there are plenty of reasons to love life in the country's second largest city. Perhaps the best word to describe Hamburg would be cosmopolitan. Due to its port, Hamburg has always been known as an international and future-oriented city. In fact, every third resident has a migration background and Hamburg is oftentimes referred to as the gateway to the world. But despite its sheer size, the city has some 1.8 million inhabitants, Hamburg is actually super green. So green, in fact, that one tends to forget one is in a metropolis at all. Numerous parks and green spaces can be found all over the city, and in 2011, the EU Commission even awarded it the title of European Green Capital. The city is rich in culture, it is inclusive, and you never run out of things to do in Hamburg. In 1972, one of the families to settle in this vivacious city was the Erchans, who chose to move to Hamburg Luru, formerly its own independent village. The Erchan family is made up of father Kamil, mother Ayla, son Abbas, and daughters Fatma and Hilal. Now, Hilal was described as a very happy, bubbly girl growing up. She was a girl who just loved life, and isn't that sweet? And her love for life wasn't in the least dampened by having to attend school. She was actually a pretty decent student and worked her hardest to score the best grades. And on January the 27th, 1999, this hard work had paid off. That day marked 10-year-old Hilal's last day of school, before her winter break was due to kick off. Understandably, this, paired with her stellar grades, meant that Hilal was extra giddy that day. Her day had started like any other. The family got up together to have some breakfast, and the kids ate Kellogg's cereal before their dad dropped the girls to school. Normally, Abbas, being the boy and at 12 years of age the eldest, would walk to school by himself, while Camille walked the girls to elementary school. And on that day, Hilal's father walked to school to pick his daughter up. When Hilal spots him, she is ecstatic, proudly. She shows off her grades, and he makes sure she knows how proud of her he is. Together, they then walk home. The family at the time lived in a modest nine-story high block of flats. As soon as they arrive on the eighth floor and enter the flat, Hilal shares her news with the rest of the family. And to reward her for her good grades, her father points to a trinket dish they kept in the flat that had spare change in it. 
Basically one of those small trinket dishes you dump everything onto as soon as you walk through the door. We all have them. Hilal, however, being the good kid she was, only took one Deutsche Mark. So very little money, just enough money actually to buy herself some Haba Baba chewing gum. Remember those? Man, I love them. Her dad though made sure she took as much money as she liked to buy herself something extra nice. But kids like what kids like. And a lot of the time, that is just some sweets. Now the family lived in a block of flats some 100 meters from their local Spar, which was based inside a small shopping center on Elbgau Passage. And as you can see here, it's not very far from their home at all. It's also a place the family was very familiar with, so they didn't worry when at 1.15pm Hilal announced that she was off to go buy herself something nice. There were two shops inside this mall where she could have bought said chewing gum. Additionally, there was also a swimming pool facility, much like a leisure center, at the back of the building. And they had a small kiosk, which also sold chewing gum. Nobody knows for certain which shop Hilal ended up going to, but one of those shops actually sold a pack of Haba Baba for one Deutsche Mark at 1.22pm that day, as per the cash register. When the female salesperson was later asked whether she remembered seeing Hilal, and if so, whether it was her who bought that gum, she couldn't remember. I mean, those types of shops see a lot of customers a day buying sweets, cigarettes, batteries and all that jazz. So it isn't a surprise that she couldn't recall every person she sold gum to that day. Unfortunate for investigators, however. On her way from the shopping mall, Hilal was briefly spotted by the local vegetable salesman who knew the family and saw her walking across the car park at around 1.25pm. He would be the only credible witness to have seen Hilal prior to her later disappearing. Now Hilal's mom actually found an earring and a hair clip of Hilal's at that very car park. And how likely is that? Now being a lady myself, I know how easy it is to lose a hair clip or an earring, but both at the same time in the same spot? Wouldn't it make more sense that someone maybe forcibly pushed her or pulled her somewhere? Abbas, Hilal's brother, later told officers how on that day he had gone to a friend's house right after school at around 12.45pm and he stayed there around an hour before returning home and seeing his parents stand in the entry doorway of their home. They immediately asked him whether he had seen his sister and he responded no, why? They then explained that she hadn't returned from the shops and told him to run upstairs to their flat and stay put. I'm assuming they wanted to keep him safe and focus solely on finding Hilal. Abba said that at the time, this didn't strike him as very unusual. Hilal had shopped there numerous times before, both by herself and with family members. However, three to four days prior to disappearing, Hilal had told her parents that a man approached her and asked her to come away with him. She was of course spooked and ran home to tell her parents. And they then went outside to look for him, but he was long gone. Abbas also said that this hadn't been the first time a man had approached his sister, but that this happened frequently. One time, when she was playing on the local playground with her friends, she even saw a man just watching them. Both Hilal and her sister Fatma then described this man as either a German or Polish man with blonde hair. And while this sounds oddly specific, sometimes when you live in a city or country with a large proportion of inhabitants from the same migration background, you're able to pinpoint who could roughly be from this or that place. And the girls thought that he looked either like a native German or Polish guy. When Hilal doesn't return by 4pm, her parents, now out of their minds with concern, called the police. In the past, Hilal had spent time at different playgrounds, but she was the kind of girl who informed her parents of her whereabouts and only went to places nearby and where they knew they could find her. Her brother said that she was a very reliable girl and would never have done anything to upset her parents. Even had she gone to visit a friend, she would have called them to make sure they don't worry. Her brother also remembers that when the family notified police, Officers told him to wait. This was at around 5pm. She had been gone hours at this point. But they followed their advice. The parents then called the home of every single classmate of Hilal's. 
but she hadn't gone anywhere. Abba said that towards the evening, his mother then got a very bad gut feeling. The kinds only mothers get. She was convinced something horrible had happened to Hilal, and he believed her. The next day, the search for Hilal finally took off, and multiple people called in, claiming to have seen something. However, as Abbas later found out via Facebook, some of those witnesses didn't feel heard by police. They felt that the information they had shared was simply dismissed by them. Riot police officers then searched fields and forests with dogs for weeks, while divers searched lakes in the area. Meanwhile, authorities put together a special commission, called Morganland, to focus solely on Hilal's case. Authorities went so far as to make use of tornado jets to search for the missing girl. The pilots were equipped with special cameras to fly over a plot of land, but couldn't detect a corpse. Then, police got the first of two promising phone calls. An unknown whistleblower claimed to have information on the case, and he agreed to meet Hilal's family at a church in Hamburg on February 3, 1999. Understandably, police offered full backup and were at the scene with the family waiting for this man to show up. I mean, they had no idea who he was or if he was harmless. They waited for hours, but nobody ever showed up. Eventually, they suspected that this mystery man might have been spooked by the many police cars driving past with flashing lights and sirens, and decided to not show his face. To this day, police have been unable to make out who this person was and desperately ask him to get in touch again. Authorities then offered a 5,000 euros reward to anyone bringing forward a crucial piece of information. But weeks would go by until a promising lead came through. Around this time, a 75-year-old woman by the name of Monika Witzen got in touch with police. This woman claimed to have heard what she described as a terrible scream through her kitchen window, that of a child. Monika panicked, and for good reason. Her grandson was due back from school. She quickly ran to the window, which afforded her a clear view of the mall's parking lot. And this is when she saw an old BMW, either dark blue or black, driving off at high speed. It turned towards Spreestrasse and then to the left, essentially out of sight. Shortly after hearing the scream, her grandson walked through the door and she felt relieved. He was safe. It wasn't until she learned of Hila's disappearance the next day that she felt alarmed again. To this day, Monica is 100% convinced that she heard that scream. It was clear as day. Two months later, in March 1999, two drivers claimed to have seen a man hold a girl who looked a lot like Hilal and was dressed similarly to her at that very parking lot by the shopping mall. On the day of her disappearance, Hilal wore a black and grey jacket, black jeans, an orange jumper and black platform shoes. She also had in her hair various hair clips and wore earrings. The man who was seen by these drivers was estimated to be around 45 years old, 1.8 meters tall and corpulent. He was on the heavier side. They also said that he had reddish blonde hair and described him as a Viking type. What an odd description. Police then asked this man to get in touch and they noted that this might have been a man harming Hilal or simply a father with his daughter. Either way, they wanted to have a word. Authorities then wanted to look into the driver of a Mercedes, who was stood in front of the booth of what was presumably his own car, likely putting in his shopping bags. A second driver, who loaded a crate of beverages into his car, was also of interest to police. However, the latter two were only of interest because they had both been at that parking lot and may have seen this mystery man grabbing that child. They were not suspects. The two drivers who had witnessed the man holding the girl had briefly stopped at a traffic light by the parking lot at between 1.30 and 1.34 p.m. This is evident from the recordings of the speedometer disc, so the time frame made sense. By May 1999, police had begun to question none other than Hila's maternal grandmother, then 54-year-old Fatma Demirbilek. Fatma had, for the most part, maintained a good relationship with her daughter and son-in-law, 
and often looked after her grandkids. Hilal herself would sleep at her nan's place nearly every weekend. However, that May, the relationship between Fatma and her daughter's family broke down. Fatma, it seemed, had secretly reconciled with her husband Mehmed, whom she was separated from, and the family didn't seem to approve. Police claimed that when questioned, Fatma had not told them the truth on more than one occasion and hindered their investigation. This, they said, was not the behavior of a concerned family member, who should have a high interest in supporting the search for her granddaughter. Hence, suspicion grew that she might have abducted Hilal to Turkey. Authorities never released more details on why they believed this to be the case. And Fatma of course said that this was ridiculous and she'd never harm her granddaughter. And not much progress would be made in the case until the next year in May of 2000. It is this very month that a man by the name of Dirk A showed up at a local police station. And he didn't come by himself. No. Dirk carried an injured girl to the station and told police that she had been attacked by another man. Now if you have an ounce of a brain, you'd drop an injured child off at a hospital rather than a police station. And if you happen to be the perpetrator yourself who decided the murder didn't go according to your plan, you'd drop her off and run. But not Dirk. He clearly hadn't thought this through. You see, he tried to strangle this young girl but ended up not killing her. So he thought he'd drop her off with police, say it's someone else and surely they just let him go. But they didn't. All of this seemed really fishy. Instead, they kept questioning him on where he found her, what state she was in, why he decided to bring her there rather than a hospital, and who he was. This is when shit hit the fan. You see, with no preparation, Dirk's story got all tangled up until eventually he broke. Dirk then confessed to attempted murder, alongside a series of child crimes. But it wouldn't be until 2005 that he'd confess to Hilal's murder. And this despite police having been on his case 16 months after Hilal's disappearance. In 2005, when pressed by police, Dirk claimed to have abducted and strangled Hilal, just like he did with the poor girl he brought in. Dirk would go on to confess to having abducted Hilal twice, and both times he would retract his confession shortly after. So who is this monster? Why didn't they look into him right away properly? Why was this left for five years? Dirk A worked as a painter, hailed from Ostdorf, and had met and spoken with Hilal prior to her presumed abduction. According to two of her friends, one day, they were heading to a local playground after school. And after watching them play, Dirk came over to speak with Hilal specifically so he could very well have been the man she had mentioned to her family. When looking into Dirk, investigators learned that he owned and sold his dark blue BMW 3 Series two weeks after he lost his appearance on February the 12th, 1999. The very car that was seen by several witnesses at the crime scene and used to abduct and sometimes even molest children in. Shockingly and sadly, Nothing would be done to retrieve this car for five years. When authorities eventually decided to trace this vehicle, they learned that it had in fact changed hands again and had likely been exported to Kosovo. Police then searched for it in the Balkans with the help of UN police, hoping to get whatever DNA they could off of it, but it hasn't been found to this day. One of the other errors of the early investigation into what was then known as Lead 380, the lead concerning Dirk A, was that police never questioned his alibi. Can you believe that? Dirk's brother-in-law, who was conveniently his employer, claimed that Dirk had been at a construction site in Elmshorn, some 30 minutes from Hamburg Ludup, on the day Hilal disappeared. The investigators did not approach other workers on the construction site, nor was the brother-in-law asked to provide proof of this. Another reason investigators likely just accepted this alibi was that they had presented witnesses who claimed to have seen the BMW at the crime scene with a photograph of Dirk, and they didn't recognize him, so they put away their file on him. This despite finding horrifying footage featuring children in Dirk's home. 
Additionally, a witness who had been at his home said that there was a video playing on Dirk's TV that featured a girl around 10 to 12 years of age. In the video, she is seen in a forest laying on her belly and she isn't moving. Her hair is black and her back appears to be covered in bruises. This witness then reached out to police about this video, but when authorities searched Dirk's apartment for it, they couldn't find it. When Dirk eventually confessed to police, he told them where he allegedly buried Hilal's body. And authorities immediately informed Hilal's family and said that they were confident that he was really the perpetrator. Dirk told police that he hid Hilal's remains in Hamburg's 2005 hectare Altona Volkspark, which is the city's largest public park, and around a 10-minute drive from the Elbgau Passage shopping center, where she was last seen. The park features beautiful walkways, large forests, gardens, and even a temple, and is understandably popular with locals. Authorities then conducted a large-scale search in the park and brought along the alleged perpetrator who they led through the park covered in what appeared to be a blanket. But when they scoured the park, they found nothing. And this is when Dirk decided to retract his confession. Hilal's brother said that he thought Dirk was just toying with police to lead them away from the place where he had actually buried his sister. An important thing to note is that one such search came to a halt due to journalists who had caught wind of this latest lead in the case and showed up at the scene to snap some pictures of Dirk. He seemed to take a dislike to that and took back his confession. Authorities also said that searching for a body in a place such as a park some 10-15 years after the crime was committed is extremely difficult due to new growth and changed surroundings. Even for someone who claimed to have been at the scene that very day, recognizing a particular area years later would prove tricky. Only a year after his first confession, Dirk would do the exact same thing again and provide police with a new place to look for Hilal. Once again, they found not one trace of her. Now Dirk has been questioned several times throughout the years and people eventually began to speculate whether he succumbed to the pressure or simply lied to get police off his back. The Wiesbaden criminal psychologist Rudolf Egg believes it is more likely that a perpetrator who has confessed and retracted their statement is actually the perpetrator. He believes this is more likely than an uninvolved person thinking up a confession and later coming to their senses. Since 2000, Dirk has been in the Oxenzoll psychiatric facility. Hilal's case then went pretty quiet until 2016. That year, police looked into a possible connection between Hilal's disappearance and German extremist Uwe Bernhardt, whose DNA had been found at the burial site of Peggy Knobloch, a girl who was murdered in Bavaria in 2001 and whose case I have also covered. However, it was later found that said DNA had in fact been inadvertently transferred there through police equipment from Uwe's corpse and that he had nothing to do with Peggy or Hilal's case. Yet another two slow years would pass before there was any significant movement in Hilal's case. Then, in January of 2018, authorities once again asked the public to come forward with any information regarding Hilal's disappearance and they hung up a picture of her near the shopping mall to stop people from forgetting her. In September that year, authorities also launched a new search into the Altona Volkspark, after a witness led police there. Police went equipped with excavators and cadaver dogs, among other things. But as previously mentioned, over 19 years later, the area had significantly changed, making a search and accurate recollection of the scene difficult. Nevertheless, police cleared the area of branches and examined the ground with long sticks. They also openly admitted to searching for the corpse of a child. However, just like in their first search of Volkspark, they found nothing. In 2020, the Special Department for Capital Crimes then took over the case. That year, Abbas also told reporters of magazine Bunte that should the perpetrator come forward and admit to the crime and hopefully tell the family where Hilal is buried, that he would forgive him. 
Abba said that the family has no reason not to forgive him, as they want nothing from the perpetrator, and it is the judge's job to decide what punishment to hand him. The Erchans have long accepted that Hilal is likely no longer alive, and they want to give her a proper burial and let their girl rest in peace. A year later, on June the 23rd, 2021, at precisely 10.03 a.m., police then got another anonymous call. A man had called in saying that he had observed several things that day in the shopping mall pertaining to Hilal's case. What he observed exactly was never made public, but authorities are very eager to speak with him again, so it must be something of substance. Yet, he left no name or any contact information, so authorities appealed to the public for him to ring again. Whether he did is unknown. Last year, police then raised the reward money from 5 to 20,000 euros. Though Dirk is still considered the prime suspect, police initially looked into another guy by the name of Joachim Q. Joachim was a tall, muscular man and worked as a computer specialist. At the time of Hilal's disappearance, he was 35 years old, divorced, and a father to two young girls. Joachim caught the eye of the police force because a driver saw him at a shopping mall in the company of an 11-year-old girl called Dania S. on May 7, 1999. So around four months after Hilal vanished. And when the driver saw what Joachim was doing to this child, he immediately called authorities. Luckily, he had memorized Joachim's number plates. Joachim had dragged his pupil away from the shopping mall in Lohbrücke, and the child screamed and tried to fight him off. But she was only 11 and pretty much powerless against this large man. He then pulled her inside his car, threatened her with a pointy tool, and then drove off with her to an isolated footpath in the woods. There, he ordered the frightened girl to remove her clothes as she asked, Will I die? She didn't die, but he proceeded to do a number of unforgivable things to this poor child that got him incarcerated in the Strafanstalt Fuhlspittel for seven years. When an investigator later asked Joachim whether he remembered what he was up to on January 27, 1999, he asked him the same question back. As in, can you remember what you were up to four months ago? And this rubbed investigators the wrong way. They thought that any normal person, even if they couldn't remember, would try their best to reconstruct the day or just remember any odd detail. But not him. When they dug into what the heck he had been up to on January the 27th, they found out that Joachim had stayed home that day. He was off sick, citing high blood pressure. Apparently, he got into an argument at work and was also battling relationship issues. And pair that with going around molesting kids, it was all too much for Joachim, something had to give. By the way, he also said that stress at work and in his love life led him to abduct and molest that child. Disgusting. According to Abbas, police thoroughly interrogated Joachim, but in the end they found no credible evidence to tie him to Hilal's case so their attention shifted to Dirk. Still, Joachim hasn't been 100% ruled out. Abbas also said that he hoped the case would be picked up by Aktenzeichen XY, a popular German TV show dealing with cold and disappearance cases, as it had been in the past. He hopes this will make the perpetrator restless and eventually come forward. And the case has stayed quiet ever since. However, in April of this year, the Erchans briefly made the news again, though it was unrelated to the case. German media reported that Hilal's father attacked his wife with a knife in their Hamburg Badenfeld apartment, presumably with the intention of killing her. When Hilal's sister tried to intervene, he struck her too. Both women were injured, though thankfully the injuries were not life-threatening. The father was escorted by police and it is unsure what will happen to him. But this is so much trauma for this poor family, it's really very sad. And sadly, though this is an old case, this is all I found to it. I've listened to a podcast, watched videos, researched articles, and there really wasn't more. Maybe I've missed something. However, if there is an update, I will make sure to mention it to you guys. Thank you for watching today's video and for listening to Hilal's story. And I'll catch you next week.
Bye, Gators.